Hello and welcome everyone to the 12th episode of Adapt Revolution. Tonight we have a special guest with us, Monique Doty from Black Lives Matter. And we're going to go ahead and let Monique introduce herself and then we'll get started with some questions. Hi, I'm Monique Keller Doty. And first I wanna thank the co-host of the program for inviting me on. I appreciate you sharing your platform and the work that you do the concept I think is wonderful. I am the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Minnesota and Black Lives Matter Twin Cities Metro. I'm also the aunt of Marcus Golden killed by St. Paul Police Officers Jeremy Dorspike and Dan Peck in 2015. So part of the work that I do, a large part of it has been working in, in solidarity, sharing my platform with others to help them amplify their voice or to find a platform for themselves to amplify their specific issues, but always in solidarity, working with all oppressed people, working to support the environmental issues that are, and even in solidarity with global issues. So it's really a, a platform of unity and solidarity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, we're really excited to get into some questions. Um, I know that Beth had an opportunity to meet you in person, and I have not yet, um, but I look forward to that at some point. Um, so, Beth, um, why don't I let you dive in with some questions? Go ahead, Beth. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, has there, I mean, I know within the mission statement that has been mentioned, but I'm wondering, you know, to what degree, you know, has anything been done yet on a national level? I haven't really seen anything quite yet, and I know that, you know, even as well known as Black Lives Matter has been you know, then, you know, become known within the corporate media, um, it, you know, as far as its, uh, stand on, uh, you know, say, y you know, women, y you know, women's issues and on LGBT issues, nothing, absolutely nothing has been mentioned on, uh, disability. We're still, you know, um, uh, you know, very much uh, incredibly marginalized to death. Hmm. And so I don't, Beth, I don't Beth, know Beth, that. Are you, are, Beth, are you asking what's the, what's the intersection between um, the Black Lives Matter movement and people with disabilities? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, basically. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know if, you know. I, I want to say I've actually known Beth for years. She's been a steady supporter uh, out in the streets with us protesting and coming to community meetings. So I appreciate you and all the work that you've done. And I had a conversation with Beth in my car and she was talking about the work that she's done over the years. Like long before Black Lives Matter, she was an activist doing work. And she was explaining to me some things about disability rights. And I thought, wow, yeah, we do actually need to embrace this more and highlight it more. And I can say that I personally have celiac disease. And so I've dealt with health issues, um, lots of medical stuff. And I it's just like, you know, out the blue, I'm like, oh, I'm getting healthy. And all of a sudden, like, this hits me. So I have, you know, come into into the situation in my own personal life where I've had to look at, like, my health disability rights and other things like that, like not being able to get insurance, which I had got turned down for life insurance, you know? So again, my platform, my personal platform and what I even do with BLM is definitely intersectionality, working with the working class, working with all oppressed people. And because unfortunately people with a disability are oppressed, they don't necessarily have access or they're still fighting to get access to certain things. You know, even like I was saying, I had got turned on for insurance. It's horrible to think that, wow, 
you I lose my job, yeah. I may not get insurance. And so that's changed where they like, okay, we can't turn you down if you have a pre existing condition. But it goes, I think, all into because most importantly, one thing I always say, I'm an anti capitalist. And because capitalism always yeah. puts profit before people, the impact on people right. with disabilities. That is not true is tremendous, right? The people who should have the yep. most care, the most compassion and the most concern are the most disregarded in that sense. And it's it's horrible, yep. right? Yep. People should not have yep. to worry. And I I have um I have a friend with a, a brother with special needs and I know it's you know the care the what she has to go through when she's working to make sure that he has proper care that is safe. And he has been abused in with care systems. The amount of abuse, and I am aware, you know, not ha <clears throat> having experienced that, but the the rate of abuse that takes place with people with disabilities completely unacceptable. And so, therefore, capitalism, right? It's about money, but we need to pay people, good people, who can do the work and pay them well, and to keep them in the field to help people, right? We need to have, make sure right. have access, right? I, I, when I see someone in a wheelchair coming out to a protest, I make sure. So what to do? I make sure I know that person because I appreciate the effort, extra effort that it takes to get there, and you know, and I let them know that. But of course, all disabilities aren't visible, right? So we don't know what someone else might be struggling with. And so many times, like if yeah. I don't see someone. I'll, I'll try to remember people reach out every once in a while, like, hey, how you doing on Facebook? Just checking in because there are things that are happening behind the scenes. Mental health is a disability. We have a lot of that in the community as well. In so many different areas that it should be highlighted more. And I'm so glad that Beth really was enlightening me about the work that she's done so much in the past. And like we actually just had a, a protest and I had, uh, I put as many things as I could fit on the the signs that people were holding on the flyer. But, you know, we said climate, you know, we, we talked solidarity with climate justice and um, trans lives and so many different things. Be it one that wasn't on there, which I know after this interview, it will always stick in my mind, is disability rights. And I think yeah. oftentimes I, I'm not even sure why it's, I know that there's work being done and I've seen people on the news. I've seen people on the news at the Capitol, you know, fighting for rights and, and standing for their rights. And so we definitely need to embrace them more. And I would say, I'm, I'm even guilty of that myself as I look to embrace and bring in other platforms and educate myself and other people educating. I share what I know, they share what I know that we can just have a better society and a better world and a better place because we have to help one another. Where I have uh, a strength, somebody else may be weak. Where I'm weak, somebody else may be strong. But we put what we have together and we make a whole, right? Yes. And if we can do that more uh -huh. in society, that's what it's about. So that's why I was like, okay, what I have done, like in our last protest, I hadn't come out and said, hey, trans, trans rights matter. We want to make sure that we have someone there talking about trans rights and elevating that platform because I stand in the privilege of being a straight woman, right? I don't have to deal with the issues of being trans or being LGBTQ. So I will often say when I introduce myself and I fail to do it today that I use she, her, hers pronouns, right? Because I want to make sure that people say, hey, pronouns are important. We have to respect the pronouns that people use, right? Yep. sharing the platform so I i'm so glad i'm here because this is really ingraining in my mind hey we're gonna make sure that we have uh you know we are embracing disability rights and beth hey we got to bring you up to talk if you're you know willing to do that as we stand in solidarity with, with other causes and other people and the globe and global issues you know yeah absolutely what would you say is your number one piece of advice for um, activists who want to kind of be in that space of cross movement solidarity? Like, what's your what's your advice to them to kind of hold on to that energy to keep to keep going? You know, to keep 
fighting um, for for these causes together? I, I think. I think everyone has to do a self assessment in terms of what their capacity is and their ability to maintain a certain pace. You know, things in life change. You know, you might look up and someone now they are taking care of an elderly parent, or now they have, you know, a child or a dog, or they have a new job that can take them away. So we see people come in and out of the movement. And, it, you know, it doesn't mean that they're not there supporting in spirit and love, but things and conditions change. So I think whatever your capacity is to come out, to get involved. And I always like to be very welcoming to people into this space. Cause I know when, when I came in, I was so thankful for the people who recognized me or said something to me, just even being Marcus Golden's aunt take, came up, gave me a hug. I was like, Oh, thank you so much. So I, I think people value being seen, particularly if someone, if it's a disability that I can see, I'm going to make sure I give them some extra love. Um, so I would just say, know your capacity, what you can do, and and it's okay to not make it out to everything. You have things that you have to do, or you might just need to rest. So get your rest. Don't run yourself right. into the ground, right? But but do what you can. And if you make a commitment, you know, reevaluate. Maybe you can't stick with that commitment, but you can do something else. And there are some people. I just saw a woman. Uh, the other day, and she's like, I was like, oh, you're working with this group now, because I hadn't seen her in a long time. She's yeah, I've been doing this for a while. Okay, good. Good. So people may take up another cause, right? Like she was doing the labor movement stuff, and then she went into the environment. So, you know, it's just doing work in some places. Do something for some forward movement, even if it's like, hey, sharing a post, write a post, create awareness, talking to your family, talking to your neighbors, Creating awareness, and that's kind of that's what Beth did with me, right? She came, she started talking about disability rights more so. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. How about you, Beth? You got you got another question? Um, yeah, I do. Um, you know, if you've been um, oh, more or less paying attention to some of the new you know, literature that's coming out on um, uh, people of color with uh, disabilities. And I guess I, you know, should I, I'm asking because uh, they're now, you know, like through um, some catalogs like Duke University and, I, and I'm, you know, getting up to um, get the, um, it's, a, um, I'll get it right, yeah, I got it right here on, you know, when and the National Women's Studies Association had their convention in Minneapolis just a year ago. I was looking through their uh, uh, catalog and, you know, and they have me now on their mailing list. I, you know, um, when I'm done with this paying off my storage room fee crap, you know, I'm gonna buy, um, you know, I would like to, uh, you know, I, uh, highlighted it, and they, um, oh, here, I'm gonna get on the page here in a little bit. It's called Black Disability Politics. And, I, and it's, or, um, it comes under uh, Black Studies, Disability Studies, Activism, and it's by Sammy Schalk, or Schalk, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't yet call that a household name, the book a household name at this point. And it's, and they put it down from 2495 to 14. 97, you know, I, I just, um, you know, I probably could be selling at Barnes and Noble, though I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, and it's called, it's called Black Disability Politics? Disability Politics, yeah, and I would love to get that and read that to help me b better understand what it is I'm getting into, um, because I'm so frustrated with, uh, you know, the disability, the few 
disability rights, quote, you know, organizations around here in the Twin Cities who really aren't adequately dealing with, you know, the topic of, you know, people of color with disability issues or, well, you know, I hate to, you know, bring up one hour topic, but one group like the Center for, the Metro Center for Independent Living, um, you know, said they were concerned about wanting to, uh, you know, start doing something on that. And then they decided they were going to put a kibosh on it. And I just, you know, decided not to have anything further to do with them. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, and I had been dealing with them in some other ways. They, you know, had a, uh, I mean, they were pretty lily white and they, you know, had some kind of support group for the LGBT uh, disabled and, and, you know, they had a lot to do with my winding up in uh, public housing, which was a terrible nightmare for four and a half years. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, but anyhow, that's, you know, I just, Well, it's all great to get book advice, you know? Yeah. I, I'm actually glad you brought that up again, Beth, because we talked about that book when we were in the car. Mm. So, Oh, really? We did. We did. So, uh, book. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked about that. And a point that I was making, like, as we were talking in the car, was that, so if we're talking about the state of Minnesota, we know that healthcare disparities between whites and blacks in Minnesota is the greatest in the nation. So you add being it's, black. I'm going to put a disability on top of it. It's it's abysmal, right? It has to be because I know even me, Very. I can for myself. My father, who was considered uh, disabled as he got older, advocating and fighting for him, like he would have died several times in the hospital had my mother not been a nurse. Mm. And the fight that, that, that he had to and I'm like, I yeah. just don't know if would this have happened if you were white, like trying to send him home when he had two blood clots in his lungs. They said, oh, he's a drug addict trying to get pain meds. No, he's not. He has two blood clots. And my, you know, yeah. Yeah. Literally, I've seen my, been there where my mother has had to fight, you know, for health care. And I know that's part of that great disparity. So to be, to have a disability and having to try to advocate for yourself. I just know even from being, I was in a terrible car accident and I'm trying to advocate advocate for myself i'm all busted up and everything and i see you and i'm like oh my god this woman's this nurse is nuts i i was like i couldn't do it so now like i don't even leave my loved ones in the hospital overnight alone like i don't do it um Mm -hmm. because i know what what can happen and i make sure i'm there to advocate because they're coming out of surgery and it was actually during covid my father had a disability could not advocate for himself and he actually died because he had to leave at eight i was like what happened you know, and, and he ended up dying. So, and I and I do know that he didn't was not getting the care he was supposed to have. That they refused to do certain things that I was saying that he needed. Um, so the fights that I know, and I know other people that are are you know are, that are black, that that's happened to. So adding dis- having a dis- having a disability and being black, it's 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 just. It should not be what it is to want to be disabled. It should not be the problem that is just being black and having to fight. You know, you put those two together, you really have to have a strong support group to make it through. So I'm glad that Beth, that you brought that out and that you were, you know, oh, thank you. You to learn more about that. I applaud you for that because here you are dealing with your own situation and you're still reaching out to advocate for someone else. You know, that's even like my, my nephew got killed. I was in that situation, but let me help somebody else, right? It doesn't hurt me to help somebody else in that situation to navigate it. So I I thank you for doing that and having the compassion to look into that more and to want to learn more. And I think, you know, hey, you want to get that book? I'll get the book with you. I'll I'll buy it for you. We can read it together, you know? Oh, great. Yeah, I'd love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love to read that book as well. Yeah. Yeah, heaven forbid. Yeah, in one organization known as Advocating Change Together, they have had just no token young black women on their board, and they are run 
um, by uh, able-bodied people and one, you know, non-disabled lesbian and one um, neoliberal city council m member from Maplewood who is disabled and I and Matt no longer have anything to do with her. And they did have one, you know, Hispanic uh, token person before he died. I have nothing to do with them anymore. It, you know, it was supposed to be run by Evan for people with uh, developmental disabilities like what my brother had before he passed on. We all had you know, it's like nobody cares, and I, but I do care about that stuff. Yeah, well, more of this work needs to be done by, of, and for the people um, that are directly, right. you know, influenced, especially by the harm that's being done. You know, um, it's in very harmful and things, and um, it's abysmal. Um, like you said, Monique, that um, that we would have a system where people get paid so little to give such important care to people on a daily basis, you know? Um, you know? Being a personal care attendant should be the same thing um, as any of the other trades. You should be able to make $35, 45 $55 an hour as a an skilled hour. home care worker, you know? Exactly. And a lot of that work has very much traditionally been done by by people of color and black folks in, in, in particular. You know, and yeah, there are time. even just so many accounts of people really not um, treating their PCAs very well, you know, and um, no, yeah, it's, it's pretty time. scary to be getting paid so little bit of money and then also being mistreated on the job and things like that. So, um, I mean, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done to really elevate home care workers and the people that they serve to um, the level of dignity and respect and the license to thrive um, that we all want um, and need so much, you know, um, in our communities and in, in this country. So, um, yeah, I've been a union PCA member now for three years and um, it's not, it's not easy work, you know. I, um, my father, my father had, um, PCAs that, uh, that came in to, uh, to help, you know, for years. And so many of them were wonderful. And I'm so thankful. Some of them were just, just like family. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, when it comes to like one, one of them, we found out like he was sleeping in his car. He wasn't, didn't have enough money, you know, from the job and he was working, you know, at seven days a week, even he had two agencies and he was coming over and, you know, my mother cooked every, she's from the South, you know, you and give out for everyone who's in your door a plate when it's time to eat. Yeah. And like, he was eating so much. It's like, wait a minute, he's, he just ate more than all four of us put together, you know? So yeah, it, it's important that we show people that their work is valued. And it is so important because when my father was there, we always had somebody else in the family there. Like my mother lived there. You know, so the, he wasn't alone, but there's so many people who are just alone and they have the PCA and we don't know what necessarily is happening. Yeah. You know, so it, we pay them, pay them well and get good quality PCAs who do the work that care about the people. And there are a lot of good PCAs out there. Yeah. And I hope that they're feeling appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. With the new contract in Minnesota for PCAs the base of the wages will go up to $20 an hour, I believe, uh, by sometime early next year. Um, oh, really? But even that is just $20 an hour, you know, um, up from what it has been 15 for the last while or so. Oh, 15 is a joke. So it's still, still minimum wage right now. Yeah. yeah. And that was about uh, seven years ago when uh, the fight for 15 now, you know, was happening. And especially after COVID, the cost of living has soared. So 15, I don't know what right. the, the livable wage is now, but I can't imagine it's still at 15 least 25, hours. At least 25, <laughs> I would think. At this point, you know, at least. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes.
Well, um, at some point in our conversations uh, on each episode, we ask our guests if they have a joke to share with us. So I'm wondering, Monique, do you have a joke to share with us? I do have a joke. Okay, Uh what did the horse say after he tripped? Uh, Nay. I can't giddy up. I can't giddy up. up. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Nice. That's my first (laughs) time hearing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad you liked it. I thought that was a cute one. <laughs> That's funny. Is there uh is there anything coming up that um you would like to share with people in terms of uh marches or events yeah. or anything like that or uh things coming up? So, um last night, I would say it's not coming up. Last night we were at the governor's temporary match uh mansion which is the uh, University of Minnesota president's house that he's renting. We were there last night protesting, standing up for clean water for the inmates in Stillwater Prison. And I would have liked to have been there. Yeah, yeah. so that it, we have to continue to fight for that because what Governor Wall said was like, hey, after they had the sit in and they put out someone put out a false narrative that there were they were holding some of the guards captive, that's false narrative, that um He's glad the situation resolved. They went back in their cells. Well, we had a mother out there saying oh, yeah. her son, the guards locked his cell so he couldn't go back in. Everyone else went in their cell and then they grabbed him and put him in isolation. She has not been able to talk to him. And he's the one who broke the story, who called Marvina Haynes, who, whose brother is in Stillwater, wrongfully imprisoned um, since he was 16. So oh, free Marvin Haynes, we're working on, you know, the community, we're working on that. But for the, it's been very important that the inmates get clean water, that they get time out, yeah. time out of their, their cells. And I know other states, there's no air conditioning. I know other states, I've saw it on the news, they were allowing the, the inmates to have additional showers because it's so hot. Extra time to cool off. Yeah. Uh, clean, 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 clean. But they don't have clean water, right? So we had um, Eliza Darius, who is a, a He's been an activist for years. He's a former inmate at Stillwater. He said even when he was there, they put socks over the spigots to try and strain the water because it was brown. What I saw in the news, they're showing reports. They said, oh, we tested the water. It's fine. They tested it for E. coli. They tested it for um, forever uh, chemicals, something else. But they didn't test it for anything that would cause the water to be brown. They weren't testing it. For the rust, for the iron, there's um, some type of um, like rust organisms as well. They weren't testing for what would cause the water to be brown. And they're saying, well, the water's fine. You know, but when inmates are calling and saying, no, it's not. Inmates who have people who are freed now saying it's not, it's brown, it's not okay. Then, you know, we need Paul Snell to, to, to actually, he needs to either move out the position and get somebody in who can do the job. But let's tell the truth. Let's get the water from the inmate cell. Let's not get the water from the staff lounge or something, you know? Where right. were they testing the water from? Where are you looking at from? Um, there's too many people saying that it's brown. So clean water, right? We want clean water for the inmates. We're also still fighting for justice for Ricky Cobb, who was, you know, shot by a Minnesota State Patrol officer and the head of State Patrol said, I don't know why he shot. They don't have to wait for the report to come back from the Minnesota BCA to fire that state patrol officer or to charge him. But Mary or Mary Moriarty's waiting. So there's that. We oh, also yeah. Turn, um, heard of her. yeah, there's some and there's there's other cases. We're always doing stuff. You see it's on our Black Lives Matter page. Tomorrow there is an action for Native Lives Matter. There's two young men that died in Anoka County Jail. Um and right now I can't remember their names, but that's tomorrow at I think it's at 7 p.m. I'd have to look. I'm so sorry. But oh, it's, it's shared on the Native Lives Matter page on Black Lives Matter Minnesota and Black Lives Matter Twin Cities Metro. That action is tomorrow. I will also make sure that I what post time is that at? to different things. I mean, whereabouts is, is it at? What am yeah. I I Let me see if I can pull this up on my computer. Um, I, get up the, I believe it's at the Anoka. Oh, here it is. The, the, the jail. You found it? 
over on my yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember off offhand where it is, but where it is, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it won't be easy for me to get. Yeah, to Beth, it. Beth, I can follow up with you. I'll find it online and I'll I'll uh, share some links as part of the um, podcast episode description as well. Uh -huh. um, so anyone that's looking for links to what's going on right now, um, you can you'll be able to find them in the podcast description. Thank oh, you. Great. Thank yeah. And I can send that to you. I can just send that to you also when we get off. I can forward it to you. It's just that I'm on my phone, not on my computer, so I can't really find it real quick. But yeah. that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so this is about other upcoming stuff? Yes, Beth, yep. Yeah, just some actions that yeah, we're Yeah, well, one thing that, you know, sucks is that because I'm not so computer literate is some of these things will happen and I find out about them after the fact, like with George Floyd. Well, once, uh, you know, after the fact, I then began marching and protesting about that, you know, after that tragedy, of course. But, you know, yeah, I... I remember, so I'll start sending you, uh, sending you events that are happening. Um, also, for my nephew, we have been meeting uh, with different elected officials trying to get the officers that killed my nephew prosecuted. Um, so, yeah, we were... Uh, are, you mean police officers? Excuse me? Uh, no, what are we... What are you referring to now? I'm referring to uh, Marcus Golden killed by St. Paul police officers Jeremy Dorr, Spike, and Dan. Okay, yeah, and this is what with who, the ones who killed Floyd, along with um. No, uh, well, I don't know what Monique's is. nephew, uh, Beth. Sorry if you can't hear uh, that well or something. Oh no, I'm trying to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're Go trying ahead, to uh, get get those. We're 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 connected, crossing off the T's and dotting the I's on anyone who would be in a position to uh, uh -huh. get these officers prosecuted, including the FBI. So <clears throat> we've been meeting with people. We've been showing the reinvestigation done by Communities United Against Police Brutality, which mm -hmm. proved everything was a lie about my nephew's murder. So. St. Paul just created an entirely false narrative. He was not he was not uh, sending threatening text messages. They have no text messages. They recorded a new 911 call. It's only 46 seconds long from the time the call is made to the time Marcus is shot. Um, they tried to auction, auction off his car. They never did ballistics. And so um, there was fresh snow on the ground and we were able to see where the officers were. They never talked to Marcus. They said they talked to him for about 20 seconds on the passenger side of his car, no footprints in the snow. And they tried not to give us um, a photo of that side of the car, but we were to get it off of another photo. No, no, no prints. He was shot in the back of the head from 80 feet away. They arrived self-reported. They did not have their lights on. Um, a witness said he uh, he probably didn't even know that they were the police. They had low profile lights. They weren't on. It was a dark, it was dark um, parking lot behind a, a apartment complex that was surrounded by like like a hill. So we were able to prove that everything was a lie, and it's time for these officers to be prosecuted. And we need a Department of Justice invest <clears throat> investigation into the pattern and practices of the St. Paul Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, because they just paid, uh, they just, well, the Cordell Handy trial just finished and Cordell Handy's family won an $11.5 million settlement. And say, the, the BCA investigated that. The investigation was not truthful and it was proved, it was proved so. So we have Jefford Smith's lawsuits coming up next. He was killed by St. Paul Police. So we have a lot going on in St. Paul and we really do uh -huh. need. The St. Paul Police Department, which is the deadliest in the state, has been under the radar because there have not been, you know, videos. Because what they do, they get to the scene and take the videos. Mm. So um, we just, uh, we have a lot of work that we're still doing, a lot of work ahead. So okay. no rest in the future for me, but that's okay. Because, you know, this it has to be done. 
Well, oh, we're absolutely. Be right there beside you. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really excited to, um, to continue to do more of this work uh, with you and to have you um, on our podcast to be able to share this message of cross-movement solidarity and, you know, um, Black Lives Matter and Disabled Lives Matter. And uh, we're all in this uh, for better lives for all of us. So, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank you for having me. I appreciate. Oh, you bet. Being here. Thank you so much. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Mm -hmm. You bet. Have a good one. I 